This podcast may contain adult themes and triggering topics. Please be kind to yourself if you get triggered by what we discuss. Also, this isn't a substitute for therapy or counseling. Please listen to the appendix at the end for some of our recommendations for resources that will help you find a qualified mental health care provider. Now, we take you to a time in the near future where emotional abuse has been appropriately deemed a crime and the survivors find a home to reclaim their lives and freedom. This is Haven, and these are the stories of the Reclaimers. Tonight, in studio, Dr. Phoenix Soleil, Acting Director of the Federal Reclamation Center, and Dr. Persephone Colossi, subject of the recent Senate inquiry that resulted in the arrest and trial of the former senator from Massachusetts. And they'll have the last word. Dr. Soleil, Dr. Colossi, thank you. I am so glad you are here. Uh, Thanks for having us, Meg. (laughs) Both of you have gone on record about the events revealed in the inquiry. Dr. Colossi, the heightened indicted status? The indictment was rescinded the moment the declarations were proved fraudulent. And the status of the Haven? Fully funded, and this morning we received our first budget notice. No more annual committee decisions as far as funding is concerned. As I recall, there was some talk about the availability of funds. The former senator from Massachusetts was convicted of fraud in his first trial two weeks ago. Apparently, he was siphoning money from the discretionary fund within the five-year allocation the Haven was initially granted. And where are those funds now? Thanks to a restitution order against the former senator, those funds are now back where they belong, courtesy the former senator's personal wealth. Well, that's wonderful news. (laughs) Thank you. We couldn't be more pleased. Yes. Dr. Soleil, your daily VidCons have gone quite viral. (laughs) (laughs) I know I myself have enjoyed the bits of wisdom you've included in each one. Would you say that they're a roaring success? (laughs) If they reach even one person to help them through a tough time, yes, I'd say that. And you're now the acting director of The Haven. Uh, Yes, and Dr. Colossi will still be on the advocate staff for the next year of her probation. Probation, huh? Yes. It was a fair assessment by our security council, considering my actions with Miss Harrison. Kari seems to be doing quite well. (laughs) I heard that she was one of your guests again last night. Yes, it was so good to see her. She seems happy. Will she be returning to the Haven now that her trial has concluded? You know that we cannot comment on the status of a survivor. Fair. But if she were to ask you to be her advocate again, would you? If that was a possibility, I would seek the director's permission and we would pose it to the ethics arm of our security council. You sound like a director already. (laughs) (laughs) Considering the awe-inspiring genius of the current director, I take that as a compliment. There was a lot of talk after the inquiry ended about how you had been wronged. Being subject to an inquiry like that must have been quite difficult. Were you offended by the accusations in the inquiry? I'm not offended at all. Any fair, moral, ethical leader should welcome the opportunity to account for their actions. Scrutiny is part of leadership. It's a much-needed process. I welcome any investigation at any time. And I learned a lot during the process. Mistakes I made, growth opportunities I can seek out. Mistakes like? I believed that I had to demonstrate good leadership through solitary, independent action. And now? I realize that the empowering tools we use at the Haven aren't just a basis for healing. They're a basis for connection. I realize now that relying on help through authentic connection is a superpower in and of itself. How does it feel to have your, how was it described during the inquiry, extraordinary telepathic gift (laughs) (laughs) as part of the public knowledge about you? A relief. I never wanted to be a secret keeper. I'm happy to have it all out in the open. Besides, now I can read the incomparably amazing Haven director without having to hide it. (laughs) Did you just read him then? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. He's squirming because I'm saying nice things about him. (laughs) Dr. Zelay? I wasn't squirming that she said nice things. (laughs) I'm just not used to her admitting that I actually run the Haven. (laughs) Oh, only for a year. (laughs) (laughs) I did want to ask you about Miss Jarrett. She's no longer at the Haven. Uh, Yes. 
uh, after her resignation last year, the Security Council at the Haven met to assess her actions. And she resigned her status as advocate? Yes, but the council offered her a compromise. She could retake her junior training to rebuild the necessary certification and become an advocate again. I had no idea. I thought she just resigned. She wouldn't allow us to go public with that information Mm -hmm. until after the inquiry. She didn't want to affect any outcomes. So she'll be returning as an advocate? No. She turned the council down. She made a complex choice up against a complex set of circumstances, and she believes resigning was the right response to her choice. Well, that is admirable. Mm. Yes, I've learned to trust her assessments. She's devoted to protecting survivors. So what will she do now? Ms. Wesley Lynn, the Haven's in-house counsel, recommended Ms. Jarrett for a spot on the newly formed, unreported section of the police force. Oh yes, we discussed that just last week. Um, to our... To remind our audience, this is the section designed to investigate unreported instances of coercive control. Yes, it's a compromise Senator Gold proposed during the inquiry to help with situations like Ms. Harrison's case, where a survivor is unable to report but needs ongoing assistance. The hope is to provide empowering tools to those who can't yet report while maintaining the demonstrable importance of consent in healing. Ah, yes. Going at a survivor's pace. Yes. A, a, yeah, a, a survivor's pace is just one part of consent. Consent is built on the rock-solid foundation of the survivor's empowerment. Judith Herman's work from a century ago still rings true. As she said, survivors can get advice, support, assistance, affection, and care from others. But only the survivor knows the cure. No matter how long it takes for a survivor to arrive at that knowledge. Only they know the way out. They just need to know we believe in them, trust them, respect them. And we have a justice system that's now dedicated to that. Before I let you go, can we go over what will happen if the former senator is convicted at trial? Oh, we're not at liberty to discuss an ongoing case that may result in Haven involvement. All right. Let's take it out of hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> An abuser is convicted of course of control. What does the new statute dictate when it comes to assigning versus the old method of sentencing? Well, first, you have to understand the nature of personality disorders. For the layperson, a personality disorder, tell us about that. The grouping that refers to narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorders, it used to include borderline personality disorder, but that was redefined a while ago. So sociopaths and psychopaths. Those are shorthand terms for antisocial personality disorder. Gotcha. So a personality disorder is probably the best way to group them all. Yes. You might hear them called Cluster B as well. Uh, They're the grouping that do not or cannot feel empathy and as a result relate to the world through a lens of entitlement and manipulation instead of connection and reciprocity. Okay, I got it. So back to the whole assigning thing. Uh, In the old justice system, the purpose of a sentence was to deter future crimes. Right. A punishment like a prison term or a large fine informs the criminal that there will be consequences to criminal behavior. Yes. Most people wish to avoid the removal of freedom, so those types of consequences are a good crime deterrent for the general population. Are you saying that people with personality disorders don't wish to to avoid the removal of freedoms? Not at all. The research pointed to a different motivator, though. Disordered personalities aren't motivated by personal freedom. What motivates them? Status and emotional supply. Emotional supply like... Well, disordered personalities aim to make their victims remember them. They want to be so memorable that a victim can never forget them. Disordered personalities interpret any emotion towards them as a sign that their victims will remember them. Even difficult emotions... People with personality disorders are satisfied to be remembered, even if it means they'll be remembered because they caused anger or resorted to tormenting their victim. Some disordered personalities prefer anger or torment because it makes them all the more memorable in the mind of their victim. Okay, so a predatory disorder personality, what you're saying is that the removal, that removing personal freedom won't deter them from future criminal behavior. Nope. Well, what will? Loss of status and removal of emotional supply. This is why the assigning is structured as it is. The idea that an offender has to willingly participate in how they'll repay society, that's a form of removing their status. 
They're no longer seen as the great predator that has to have an entire society intervene against them. Instead, they're seen for the immature manipulators they really are. They're too immature to even plan out their own lives, so they require careful assistance. They're not given a bunch of pomp and circumstance surrounding a high-profile trial, a high-security sentence, and their name all over the press. Oh, right, like the new guidelines about the perpetrator's name in the news. Yes. The justice reform changed all that. Offenders are listed by their former title, or known simply as abuser, to their victims. The intent is to remove their status and remove any hope they have of being remembered because of their crimes. And emotional supply? How, how do you remove that? Well, first, you have to get the victim healed. Surround the victim with support and opportunities to heal. Help the victim reclaim their identity and mythologize the victim story. Honor what they've suffered. Celebrate that they've survived. And finally, ensure that the predators are never again allowed contact with their victim. And that works. It seems much simpler than our previous system. The more the system is set up to support the victim, the more perpetrators fade into the background. That fade becomes a loss of status, and that's a deterrent that disordered personalities understand. Has there ever been a system like this? The most successful civilizations have always prioritized support for victims. True justice isn't possible where there isn't holistic and community support for victims. That holistic support, what does that look like? Everything about the process is designed to give the survivor support. The empath counsel is present to advise the court regarding instances of manipulation so the survivor can feel safe. A trial team from the Haven is available to the survivor, and judges are required to attend advocacy training too, so they have knowledge about a victim's reaction to the trauma. And the court is required to set aside a post-conviction time for a victim statement should the victim want to deliver one. Oh, and finally, the assigning is where the victim has a chance to witness their abuser take responsibility for what they've done by proposing a court-approved plan that will offer restitution to their victims and pay the costs associated with maintaining the system of support for all victims. In this way, the perpetrator is given a chance to assign themselves the work necessary to literally repay society. Hmm. Okay, I got it. So that's why there's an assigning and not a sentencing. That's clever. Who designed this holistic system of support? Dr. Was a- Colossi. <sighs> This is all thanks to you. Uh, She's about to deny that, but Meg, it really is thanks to Dr. Colossi. Without her stubborn and inspiring courage, none of us would be here right now. (laughs) Now who's squirming? (laughs) Well played, Dr. Soleil. Dr. Colossi. That's gratifying to hear someone I respect as much as Dr. Soleil say something like that. And I may have provided the spark. But the fires that light the way out of hell for survivors, those are kept burning by the advocates. Brilliant. I'm sure our audience will want to know, what is next for both of you? Uh, Well, Dr. Colossi has granted me permission to publish a paper about my experience as her advocate and the complex trauma resulting from the abuse she suffered. When you do, please let us know. We'll have you back as soon as we can to talk about it. And you, Dr. Colossi? I... Plan to go on helping victims tell their stories. That's it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I, I also plan to dare to be average. Dare, dare to, be to be average? Yes. Survivors are Like often, yourself? Yes. Uh, like myself. We've had to go to extreme lengths to survive what we've been through. Those extreme lengths can result in thinking that all of life is overachieving. To combat that, I'm going to dare to be average as possible. To let the work I've already done have some fresh air while I live a completely average life. (laughs) What a beautiful thought. May I say, thank you to you both for the work you've done to give hope to victims everywhere. And thank you for all you're doing to support victims too. It takes more than just the justice arm of this system to bring hope to survivors. The news media plays a huge part in that. Dr. Soleil and Dr. Colossi from the Federal Reclamation Center of Washington, D.C., I appreciate your time. After the break, I'll be joined by a group of survivors who will speak about their positive life changes since leaving the Haven, and a few therapists who will affirm the effectiveness of the empowering tools from Dr. Soleil's groundbreaking book, published just six years ago.
Hey, it's Percy and Feeney here. What you've just heard is a work of fiction, but we know that many listeners are living in a world of pain that isn't fictional at all. At the end of every episode, we're going to include an appendix of sorts. Some things we hope will serve those who live with a reality of fear and pain every day. First, we want to let you know about our website, www.empowering.tools, where we keep an ongoing list of books, websites, hotlines, and many other resources for victims and survivors of toxic relationships. Second, we love to hear from you. If you'd like to share your story with us or let us know how the episode impacted you, we'd love for you to reach out. These are deeply emotional things and we want to give you a chance to share. We're a small team, so an in-depth response isn't always possible, but we do read every message we receive. Third, if you're in crisis or you need to find an immediate way out, please call 800-799-7233 for the National Domestic Abuse Hotline. If your abuser is a parent or a non-romantic relationship, there are other resources we've listed on the website that are just for you. A reminder, emotional violence is still violence. You don't need to have bruises on your body to deserve help, and it's okay to feel what you're feeling when you call. Fourth, be safe. For some, getting out will take planning and time. If you know you need help, do what you need in order to safely get away. Lastly, we know how difficult it can be to believe there's hope on the other side of a toxic relationship. Many on our team know the devastatingly difficult steps it takes to get away from an abusive predator. But there is hope. You don't have to do it alone. If you don't have supportive family or friends, you can still find support at the hotlines we mentioned earlier or at a local hospital or shelter. Thousands of survivors have made it out. Getting out and reclaiming your freedom can be your story. We believe in you. We believe in your future. And And we we believe believe in your right to that freedom. freedom.